In the 1930s, a remote farmhouse in Cashin's Gap on the Isle of Man became the focus of weird events. Following a poltergeist outbreak, a small strange creature appeared. The Irving family, who owned the house, heard the animal speak. It claimed to be a mongoose called Jeff, who had been born in India in 1852. Jeff haunted the family for almost a decade and became world famous. He was even mentioned in the British Parliament. Although the house at Cashin's Gap was demolished in 1971, Jeff remains a Fortean icon to this day. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's me, uh, Barry Tadcaster, back again. And uh, this is my old mate, Jeff the Talking Mongoose. I'm an earth wonder at world, me. Thou shalt never know what I am. I already know what you are, you're a talking mongoose. Oh, that's by the by, that's by the by. I was born in New Delhi in 1852. Hey! Well, you've aged quite well, ain't you, mate? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Jeff, what are we up to this week? Well, this week... This week, uh, we're, we're going to be... Uh, the, the whole faculty, the whole faculty of the CFZ is going to be performing Charles Moratin's gothic novel, Melmoth the Wanderer. In their pants! Okay, just in case you wonder, what am I doing here on a cold winter's night taking photographs with a microscope? It's because this is the microscope we introduced you to in the last episode that Carl got for the princely sum of a tenner from a car boot sale. And considering the fact that the microscope this very model cost something like 120 quid and they still make them. That was a remarkably good... That was a remarkably good um, bargain. But we have a problem in that the light on the microscope isn't strong enough. We managed to sort out the first problem, which was getting the microscope to speak to a computer. And, of course, whenever we have a problem that's related to the digital universe, we go to Louis in Sussex, because he's really good at this stuff. Don't call me computer boy! But he is now going to have to fit in a new light. Now, you can see there are, new li there are lights at the top here. And... There's a light at the top here and a light underneath there. And Louis has sourced new and more powerful units for both of them. The problem is that the one underneath comes from China and the one above comes from Amazon in the UK. What we're hoping to do is that um, we'll be able to just do the top light which comes from Amazon and costs 12 quid, rather than the bottom light, which comes all the way from China and also costs £12.50. But, why, you may ask, why do we need a stronger light? Well, it's simple, because what we're doing, or we're trying to do, is to take hair samples that Carl and Geordie have gone out into the middle of the forest of Dean in the middle of the winter to find and we want to be able to identify what species they are from the hair samples and you need a light that's strong enough to be able to pierce through the hair sample because it's not just, as I originally thought, a matter of being able to identify the scalation on the outside of the hair. You need to know more about the internal 
um, the internal uh, structure of the hair, which is different in every species. And to do that, you need a stronger light. But why am I taking the photographs? Well, it's simple. Louis wants some detailed photographs of all the different parts of the computer. It's a microscope, you silly old fool. Now, I don't want you to embarrass me in front of my doggy friends. So he can make sure that the right things are ordered rather than run at it like a bull at the gate and buy the wrong things. So I'm taking the photographs. They'll be sent to Sussex overnight and... It's over to you, computer boy. The other day I read a really interesting article in The Guardian. It was written by Patrick Barkham, who is a researcher and author for whom I have a great deal of respect. Long-standing viewers of this show will remember that about ten years ago, after reading his book, The Butterfly Isles, I interviewed him for On the Track, and what a fascinating guy he turned out to be. His article told the story of a group of people who refer to themselves as introductionists, and begins with this bold mission statement. A handful of radical nature lovers are secretly breeding endangered species and releasing them into the wild. Many are prepared to break the law and risk the fury of the scientific establishment to save the animals they love. Of course, introducing animals into the British Isles is nothing new. The Romans brought fallow deer, the Normans brought rabbits, and the 19th century saw the advent of the Acclimatisation Society, a marvellously eccentric bunch who were responsible for introducing such species as Wells catfish, peacocks and other exotic Asian pheasants and many other creatures to the United Kingdom for no real reason other than the fact that they could. So what's different about these people? Well, the self-styled introductionists have taken it upon themselves to circumvent the annoying levels of red tape and bureaucracy that surround any official introduction or reintroduction to the United Kingdom. Barkham writes... They have quietly released captive-bred wild animals that were once commonplace in Britain. Beavers, turtle doves, butterflies, even glowworms. One introductionist I spoke to, Graham Wellstead, has released hundreds of polecats into the English countryside, helping this once persecuted small carnivore spread across the south and east of the country once again. Another man's captive breeding program has revived the endangered sand lizard. In this article, Barkham follows the work of Martin White, who is responsible for having reintroduced the marbled white butterfly to large chunks of the North Midlands and the Purple Emperor back into Lincolnshire. Barkham examines White's most audacious project yet to reintroduce the Mazarine Blue to England after it was extirpated at the end of the 19th century. The Mazarine Blue is a beautiful butterfly distributed throughout continental Europe, as far north as the Arctic Circle and as far south as Morocco and the Middle East. Nobody knows why the species became extinct in Britain, although it has been hypothesised that one possible cause could be changes to the method of haymaking, resulting in clover, the larval food plant of the species, being inadvertently cut down while the species was still in its immature stages. I'm one of nature's anarchists, both politically and socially, and I have nothing but admiration for people like Martin White, and I hope very much that this project succeeds, even though there is one big reason why it probably won't. Like so many of the people I have loved over the past 12 months, Martin White came down with cancer early in the year and died in early October. Much of what he has written is available for free online, and so I sincerely hope that his work doesn't die with him. In the last 10 days of the old year, we received some very bad news. Brian Sykes, Professor of Genetics at Wolfson College, Oxford, and an old friend and supporter of the CFZ, 
died of cancer. I didn't know him as well as Richard, so I phoned Richard up to talk about him. Well, uh, I first met Brian, so I became aware of him, um, when we did our, our conference, the, uh, the CS3 annual conference, uh, uh, the weird weekend. And he came down to talk about uh, his new project where he was uh, wanting people to send him supposed hair samples from various mystery apes and relic hominins from all over the world. And um, I found him to be utterly charming and having a great sense of humour, unlike many academics. And uh, when I did my surreal introduction, of uh, claiming that he was a scientist that in 1974 invented the bag and before that we all carried things around on on um, wooden boards. So he, he sort of ran with that and, and took out a bag and said that it was his latest design. <laughs> and uh, well, he, he was a human geneticist, a professor of genetics at Oxford University. And his work was really important because it pushed forward analysis of um, conditions such as brittle bone disease. And he also perfected uh, a way of extracting DNA from very ancient bone samples, some of them dating back 12,000 years. Now, he focused on mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria are the organelles within cells that release energy. And mitochondrial DNA or mtDNA, uh, it's inherited from the female line. And the mitochondria are found between the wall of the nucleus of each cell and release energy. And so they're quite abundant. So it's easier to get DNA from them than it is for nuclear DNA because there's so much more mitochondria. And uh, the, the professor, uh, he perfected a, a type of analysis by examining a DNA segment called... 1,2-S-R-N-A, which is part of the gene that helps mitochondria assemble enzymes required for uh, aerobic metabolism. And this sequence is known for all species of mammal, so there could be no confusion uh, from any sample sent to the project because they've got it all on record. They've even got to see uh, 1,2-S-R-N-A from Neanderthals, and they know that it differs from modern man. So if there was a, a hypothetical new species of ape or, or hominin, it's like it's one to S R N A it would be diff different from all known species. So together with Michael Satore, um a uh, museum director and zoologist from Switzerland, they instigated this project and um when we were going out, the we were going out to do the Almasky hunt in Russia. He he wanted me to take a load of samples of the local people, but unfortunately we couldn't do that because there was a communication breakdown, and nobody really knew <coughs> what we wanted to do. And our guide, uh, uh, our guide, uh, didn't really explain well enough to the people what was wanted, uh, Gregory Panchenko, and he thought they wouldn't have gone for it anyway. So unfortunately, we couldn't get those samples. But we did bring back some hair from a nest of dwarf rhododendron found uh, by Dave in a cave, but it turned out to be from a modern human being. So it was probably just a hunter hunkered down there uh, on this mountainside. But um, he himself, you know, went all over the place. He, he went to Russia himself, um, home of the original Snowman Commission, uh, set up in the 1950s, and uh, he went to North America on the track of Bigfoot. But all of the, the samples of hair he got turned out to be from wolves or bears or dogs or people or domestic animals. Uh, they were all red herrings. But the interesting thing is he analysed some teeth from a skull that was belonged to a man called Quit, who died in the 1950s, 53 if I remember correctly. Now Quit lived in a small uh, village in the Western Caucasus in what is now Georgia 
and his mother was supposed to have been Almasty. Now, this creature, who was called Zaina, um, was captured in 1850. She was six foot nine inches tall, had black skin, was covered in reddish hair, immensely muscular, flat nose, very thin lipped, broad jaws, big teeth, brow ridge, sunk eyes. Uh, she couldn't speak. Um, and she never did learn to speak, but they kept her on this farm and she came down quite quickly. Um, she did menial tasks around the, the farm, like carrying sacks of grain about. She was immensely strong. So in, in, in essence, they used her as a sort, of, uh, a sort of machine to work on the farm. But she slept outside in a stockade because uh, if she, she was brought inside, she'd sweat profusely and she couldn't stand the inside. But she was very fond of um, booze, and if she got hold of liquor, she would drink until she was unconscious. And several of the local men from the village had their way with her. God knows why they wanted to when you hear a description of her. Um, but she had a number of hybrid children. And these children apparently looked very human. The human genes uh, won out, so they weren't hairy. They didn't have this ape like face, but they were very big and strong, much stronger than... Uh, modern humans and the first few died when she tried to wash them in a river so subsequently they were taken away from her the other ones and uh, these I think there were three or four of them and they they all lived happily in the village were adopted by human families and grew up to be fairly normal looking human beings. They were swarthier than the local people and much, much stronger. It's said that Whit could, his party piece was to have someone sit on a chair and bite the back of the chair and he could lift the person in the chair off the ground with his own, just his own teeth and jaws. Now, uh, when they found his skull, it looks like it was within the parameters of normal human beings. It did have somewhat of a brow ridge, but nothing like, a, say, a Neanderthal or a Homo erectus did. Uh, it did have big, powerful jaws, but nothing too freakish. Uh, now, Igor Butsev had this skull. It was at the Darwin Museum for ages. Igor Butsev brought it, and he offered up two teeth to this project that, that Brian Sykes was doing. And Brian Sykes got some mitochondrial DNA from these teeth. Now, at first, he thought they were sub-Saharan African human. And that was the first thing he thought. And all the press jumped on this before he'd actually finished his studies. But the more he studied it, the more he realized this wasn't from a homo sapien. It was from sub-Saharan Africa. But he reckoned that this mitochondrial DNA that had been handed down from the mother's side, so from Zaina to quit, this creature that had been captured there, uh, he reckoned it was an unidentified form of hominin that would have arisen in West Africa and migrated out of Africa maybe 150,000 years ago. And he thought they were, they were still there in the Caucasus Mountains. Now, I spoke with him on the phone about this on a number of occasions, and uh, I also exchanged emails with me. And the last email I got said that he was working with a numerical geneticist uh, on this uh, sequence of DNA he got from Quick's teeth. And, and he was still thinking that this was quite possibly a new species of unknown hominin, so not from a human being. And then um, the correspondence dried up, uh, obviously, because he was ill. And now I found out that he, he passed away from cancer. So I can only hope that somebody somewhere is carrying on his, uh, his work with this sequence of DNA. Because every time we see to, seem to get onto something solid, it slips through our grasp. I've been on the trail of um, some possible Yeti DNA. Uh, environmental DNA, or eDNA, uh, that was taken a couple of years ago from a pool in Bhutan. And I spoke to the geneticist who examined it, and she said whatever it was, it shared 98% of its DNA with human beings. It was primate. And it was as closely related to human beings as chimpanzees. So much more closely related to, to us than the orangutan or the gorilla. And there is nothing in, in Bhutan that we know of that, that has that closely related DNA. 
so it's some sort of primate, and this is just where the, the Yeti has been reported. Now, uh, the, the lady involved, Dr. Eva Bellamain, uh, she worked for a company called Spygen, which sounds like something out of that Ian Fleming novel. But uh, my friend Christopher Killian has been in touch with them because uh, Eva Bellamain said she no longer worked for them, and she thought that the, the sample was still there, but she didn't have access to it. So my French colleague, um, Christopher Killian, who I went to search for the orangutan deck with, he got in touch with them, and they said that they were... Um, they still had it, but they couldn't give it away because it it belonged to the people who produced the program. Uh, so they were not allowed they were not allowed to fiddle about with it or do anything with it, basically. So he's going to try and now get hold of the people who legally own it, the producers of the program, and to see if they can get to do something with it. But it's a similar thing with. But Fikes' work, it seems to have slipped through our fingers unless his colleague is still working on it. Well, let's hope so, because I hate to think that Brian Sykes will just go down in history as just another victim of this horrible year. Mm. But I really, really, really have never lived through a year like it. It's a nightmare. That's perfect, Richard. Thank you very much. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's me again. Over the last few months you've probably noticed that on the track has changed. Well, there's a very good reason for that. The thing is that between 2000 and 2017, that's 17 years for those of you who can't count, I was the main promoter of an annual event called The Weird Weekend. And it was a conference aimed at, about and for people from the Centre for Cryptozoology. And although it wasn't all about cryptozoology, it was all full of events and lectures and film shows and ex exhibitions on subjects which I thought the people from the Centre for Fortune and Zoology would be interested in. And it was all wrapped up in a nice overcoat of surreal fun. And you know what? I miss it terribly, which is why about six months ago I decided that I was going to rebrand the plan. I thought we'd do a monthly episode in about half an hour. And then, in between each episode, we do what I call On The Track Extra, which resurrects somewhat of the feel of the old movie weekend. And I have a look at these two examples, which I chose almost at random because I thought 